Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think any introduction I give now will just seem quite futile. There's one thing that I've always sort of said in, in, presenta in my presentation workshops. If, if, you're, if you're really doing a good presentation, all right, it should be a bit like uh, a Paul Fenwick presentation. And whatever you do, always avoid presenting at the same time as a Vic Oliver. <laughs> And we happen to have both of them on the stage at the same time. That's really, really absurd. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Fenwick. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to my talk. I come to you from the league of overambitious new inventors, engineers, and scientists. I fear that our organization has gained something of a bad reputation in recent times. Most of this is undeserved, but I do admit that there were a couple of bad decisions by some of our members in the past. Marketing cocaine toothache drops to children was possibly not the best idea. And so I have a message for you, the inventors of tomorrow. Please don't screw up. If you are going to invent healthy asthma cigarettes, which can treat asthma, hay fever, foul breath, all diseases of the throat, head colds, canker sours, and bronchial irritations, please market them responsibly and make sure that they are not smoked by children under the age of six. If we look at some of history's early inventions, we discover that a lot of them focus on harnessing animal power. The plough, the millstone, the cart. <laughs> but inventions only started to truly flourish once we reached the Victorian era, when we discovered that not only could we an harness animal power, but also animal intelligence. This is shown in no greater invention than the Tempest Prognosticator. This wonderful detailed device, which I have a picture of there, was invented by Dr. George Merriweather in the year 1851. It employed a redundant array of inexpensive leeches, or rail, in order to predict the weather. It is an interesting fact that freshwater leeches are agitated by approaching storms. And Dr. Merriweather had a brilliant idea. Here is one of his diagrams. Put simply, you could have a glass container filled with a small amount of fresh rainwater and a leech. When the leech became agitated, it would climb the edges of the container and would dislodge a small piece of whalebone at the top. This, in turn, would pull upon a chain, which transferred its force to a pulley, which then rang a small hammer connected to a bell at the top of the device. It was described by one of Dr. Merriweather's colleagues as one of the grandest ideas that ever emanated from the mind of man. You will also notice that the device made use of glass bottles. And this is quite important. You might think that this was so monitoring would be easier. If one of the leeches were to fail, we could have it easily replaced. But no. The reason why it involved glass bottles was this. Dr. Merriweather claimed it was so that his little comrades do not endure the affliction of solitary confinement. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This was social networking for leeches. The 
their results of the device were surprisingly accurate. And despite continued advertising efforts to have this installed on all coastal towns, it was never widely adopted. The reason for this, I suspect, is due to the undesirable form of maintenance needed to keep the device working in full operation. And in fact, the idea of blood-fueled devices did not end with a Tempest prognosticator. Only a few years ago, intellectual property lawyers from SCO <laughs> decided that they needed an edge over the competition. They invented a device that not only allowed them to write their names in blood, but entire documents in blood. Seeing this in operation was truly horrifying. But for most of us, we have this idea that blood does not mean fuel. But imagine if it did. Imagine all the cool things you could do if you could use your blood as fuel. We pretty much have all the technology we need to have these active digital tattoos. Implanted just under the skin, you have an active matrix which can be used to display information. So this could show you your health information, or perhaps your Twitter stream, or combined with other devices, could be used as a mobile phone touchpad. But the problem with such a device is how do you power it? If you have standard chemical batteries, they need to be replaced. And that is awkward and painful. It would be much, much better if we could have a blood glucose fuel cell. And in fact, such, such things do exist. The problem with blood glucose fuel cells is that the catalysts are easily poisoned by some of the more recreational drugs that people like to take. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have a fuel cell that was capable of self-repair? A fuel cell that was alive. Well, scientists in Japan have done exactly this. They have developed a living fuel cell by using some very clever nanoengineering and genetic engineering. They have employed an embedded yeast matrix, which gives you power. Now, I have a picture of it here. The important thing to note about this picture is the scale. This is 15 millimeters square. It's absolutely tiny. So you can't get much power out of something that size. But the nice thing about these devices is that they are scalable. You can make them as big as you want. I want one where I can power my laptop. The way in which these work is quite simple. It simply uses the standard metabolic processes present in yeast. In other words, it takes glucose and oxygen, and it gives you back water, carbon dioxide, and energy. And through some very, very clever chemistry, the fuel cell is able to extract some of that energy from the metabolic processes in the yeast. Now, this is pretty cool, but they haven't been widely adopted. And there's a really good reason why. And that's due to what happens under high load. Now, you might think, oh dear, this is the high load of when I'm like, trying to draw lots of power, but it's not. Our bloodstreams and our bodies are very, very good at telling us, hey, we've got low blood sugar, go and find some chocolate. The problem is actually when you have the person or the host under high load, such as during heavy exercise. During heavy exercise, your oxygen levels can dip. And rather than having an aerobic reaction to create energy, you now have an anaerobic reaction. Some users actually consider this a feature. <laughs> but if you wish to see truly horrifying examples of inventions, we need look no further than toys. Toys are supposed to be these wonderful, innocent things. Toys are supposed to be adorable. They're supposed to be inspiring. They're supposed to be educational. But sometimes, toys go wrong. The year is 1996, and Cabbage Patch dolls' sales have been flagging. Mattel is desperate 
for a new way to reinvigorate their line. And they come across a masterpiece. They invent this. The Cabbage Patch Kid Snack Time Doll. Proclaimed on the cover of the doll packaging is this. Feed me and I really eat my food. It comes with a collection of small plastic snacks. And when you feed it a plastic snack, it chomps om nom nom on that snack. It does this by employing... Vic, you, you don't have to stand there. You can sit down if you want. <laughs> it does this by employing a pair of one-way metal rollers, which take the plastic snack and grind it into fine dust, which is then deposited in the backpack of the toy. This was absolute marketing genius. Mattel had taken the economic model which we now see in inkjet printers <laughs> and applied it to toys. But there's a problem with this. When the toy ran out of snacks, the parents were not always eager to go out and buy new expensive snacks to give it. And so children would be left wondering, what else could you feed it? <laughs> Things which immediately came to hand were siblings, especially fingers, and more horrifyingly, hair. The way in which the doll worked is it had some mouth sensors, and provided anything could be detected in the mouth, it would continue to operate those one-way metal rollers. Now, it is possible to turn the device off if you have the presence of mind to take off the backpack, find the battery compartment, open the battery compartment, and remove the batteries. But when you have a zombie freakish doll <laughs> that is chewing down on your hair and intent on eating your brain... It can be very hard to keep that presence of mind. Over 100 injuries later, there was a full product recall. And the dolls immediately became a highly sought-after item on eBay. The next toy that I wish to examine is that of Melty Beads. Who here has used Melty Beads in the audience? Some of you have. Some of you might not know them as Melty Beads. Melty Beads are cool. What you can do is you can lay out a cool shape using plastic beads, and then you can use an oven or an iron or some other hot implement to melt those beads, and you get a cool toy like this. Now, there's a problem with Melty Beads. And that is that they fundamentally require high temperatures, which are generally incompatible with small children. So a few years ago, an Australian company came out with a fantastic alternative. They were called Aquadots, but they were also marketed under the name of Bindis, Bindos, or Pixos. And they received Toy of the Year in 2007. What made these special is they did not require a heat source. Instead, they were coated with a water-activated adhesive. So all you had to do was place the dots in the position you wanted, spray them with water, or lick them if you didn't have a source of water available, and they would form a cool toy. But they had a problem, specifically with the first release of the toys. They were supposed to be manufactured using 1,5-pentane diol, which is a fairly harmless plasticizing agent. However, the factory that was subcontracted to produce the toys instead substituted the much cheaper 1,4-butane diol. Now, this is quite important, because if you consume 1,4-butane diol, 
it is metabolized by your body into gamma-hydroxybutyric acid. More commonly known as GHB. (laughs) Or by its street names of GBH, liquid ecstasy, or fantasy. The beads were popular with children. (laughs) And one or two beads could keep a child amused for hours. (laughs) But any more than that would invariably have some rather nasty side effects. Unsurprisingly, there was a full product recall. But the best toy that I could find, which also happens to be the coolest toy that I could find, was this, something close to my own heart. The Gilbert Uranium-238 Atomic Energy Lab. This contained everything that the budding nuclear physicists needed to start their career. It contained a Geiger counter so that you could detect radiation. It contained a cloud chamber, so you could observe particle effects firsthand. And of course, what kit would be complete without four samples of actual uranium ore? (laughs) Of course, this was marketed at children, so it also came with a comic book. Learn how Dadwood splits the atom. (laughs) But my favorite part of the kit was this little brown book here, because that contains knowledge that every child needs. Prospecting for uranium. (laughs) The Uranium-238 Energy Lab was only produced for a single year. It was not recalled from the market. Instead, it was discontinued due to poor sales. The other area where we have some interesting inventions, is that of emergency devices. Emergency devices are somewhat unique in how they operate, because under ideal situations, emergency devices are rarely used. Hopefully there is no emergency. And therefore, manufacturers of these devices tend to have a habit of trying to optimize for secondary issues. So let's take an example. Here we have the humble fire alarm. And most of us know how these work. You break the glass, you press the button, and a big red truck arrives. The problem is that happens regardless of whether or not there's an actual fire. And so you can have pranksters who believe that it's fun to set off fire alarms. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we had a fire alarm that could catch these miscreants? So we can bring them to justice, or we can discourage them from setting off the alarm in the first place. Well, in fact, a recent invention has done exactly this. You might not be able to read the text on this slide, but the headline says, Firebox Traps Pranksters. And below it reads thus, Demonstrated above is a new fire signal box that locks the alarm of the sender until released by a policeman or fireman with a key, thus deterring the sending of false alarms. I want to make it absolutely clear what this device does. In the case of an emergency, it traps your arm (laughs) near a blazing inferno. (laughs) Needless to say, this reduced the incidence of all fire alarms. And despite this seeming like a supremely bad idea. It's this sort of thing that continues to inspire modern designs, like the emergency button that you can lock with a key so you can't press it by accident. (laughs) In this new age where you might have a delayed response from the fire department, the concept of fire survival now becomes paramount. Let's imagine that you're in a high-rise hotel You're in one of the upper floors, and there's a fire. 
you have no means for escape and you have to wait for rescue. In such a situation, the dangers of smoke inhalation are paramount. You are much more likely to be incapacitated by smoke well before the flames reach you. In this situation, what you need is a source of fresh, breathable air. And in fact, it's this exact scenario which has inspired the fresh air breathing device, which is the subject of US patent 432756. This is a device which is so unique, so inspired, so different, that I simply cannot describe it using words. And so instead, I will simply present you with a diagram from the patent application. The inventor of this device suggested that this be made available in all hotel rooms and also distributed to emergency services personnel in case they should need a breath of fresh air <laughs> while going throughout their duties. I know the sort of breathing device that I would rather use. But what about the modern age? Well, we've seen that we can harness animals for power and we've seen that we can harness animals for an, uh, animals for their intelligence, but we can also harness animals for intelligence. And this was a study undertaken by the CIA some years ago. They created a project called Acoustic Kitty. The idea of Acoustic Kitty is a specially trained cat would be outfitted with monitoring devices and therefore could listen in on conversations. <laughs> by suspected enemy agents. It required $20 million worth of training, technology, and research. Finally, the cat was ready. Its first mission was to spy on two suspected Russian agents that were going to be meeting in a park. The unmarked CIA vehicle drove up opposite the park and released the cat from the car. The total time that the cat remained in the field before failure was 12 seconds. <laughs> As it went to cross the street, it was hit by a passing taxi cab <laughs> and killed instantly. The other thing which seems to be ubiquitous in this modern age is that of advertising. It seems that a lot of the web runs on advertising these days. That's how people make their money. But if you happen to live in the Ukraine, the fog can be so thick that you can actually put advertising onto the sky itself. There we have a picture of some advertising for some real estate. This actually has its own unique problems because should any of your equipment fail, it can be quite embarrassing for everyone. <laughs> But I would like to end with a device for you. The new age with the digital millennium. In order to increase your productivity in your day-to-day -day lives, I can recommend that you go and purchase this. It is the laptop steering wheel desk, available now from Amazon.com. This fantastic invention provides you with a safe, stable desk from which you can use your laptop and other personal devices whilst driving your car. I'm sure that you can only imagine the gains in productivity.
ladies and gentlemen, this has been a public service announcement from the League of Overambitious New Inventors, Engineers and Scientists. Thank you very much. Do we have well, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say. <laughs> Um, what was the patent number for the um, hotel safety device? The patent number, this is, it's brilliant. It's the best patent ever. It is 42,000 something, something, something. There we go, 43. I'll leave that up on the board so you can look it up. It's a real patent. Um, so how long before we can go near Vic again? How long until... Before we can go near Vic again? Oh, um, maybe it's got a half-life of about 20 years. <laughs> so Vic. I'm guessing in about five years he won't be radioactive anymore. <laughs> From that sort of exposure. Okay, if there's no more questions, I've been asked to provide a reminder that there is... Oh, there is more questions. Right in the middle here. Oh, the red gloves are for handling my science. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I do have an announcement. I've been asked to remind you all that there is the ha hackathon? Hack off, thank you. There's hack off happening in the town hall inside Civic 1 and 2 immediately after this talk. So anyone who looks like getting their code on, you can head over there. And if I can't spot any more questions... Oh. Where did you get your laser goggles? Okay, so the goggles, for those of you wondering about costuming, <laughs> the goggles are actually a pair of $10 welding goggles which have been painted with silver paint. This is one of the advantages of being a geek. You like have all these miniatures and paints available to you. <laughs> so total cost was about $12 to make these. One more question back there. Being LinuxConf, which of these products are open source so that we may can duplicate them? <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard the beads as being a good idea. I agree there. <laughs> The patent probably is expired, yes. At least I hope it is. Um, could you tell us about any um, inventions of your own personally, which in hindsight have turned out to be not the stroke of genius which you believe they were when they were conceived? Most of the software I've written more than 12 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so how bad, on the, how bad on the invention scale do you think the rep rap is? <laughs> Sorry, how bad on the invention scale was... The rep rap. I think the rep rap is pretty cool. I love the rep rap. Did I miss something? Is it like, has it like spawned an army of killer robots recently that's going to take over the world? Because that's where it's heading. <laughs> okay, I, I think I am out of time. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very, very much. I'll see you around the conference. <laughs>